If you think about it, all art is about perception and about artists exploring how to manipulate, appeal to, trigger our perception. And that's really the essence of art making and to me that puts XR in a complete alignment with the evolution of art history. It's, it does more than even cinema and television because of the interactivity. Here you're using digital media to create artwork. It's, there's no difference to me. I don't really even think about it as XR. I think about it as it's just art. Going into a three-dimensional environment is so much more compelling and immersive than looking at a flat screen. I find it encouraging that people have a real eagerness to explore the future, but also the history. The Victorian period and the 21st century, we don't normally think of those in direct continuity. Then and now, there was this fascination with creating the perfect image. The Initial 3D formats involved using two different images, directing them towards the eyes and the brain, then synthesizes them into a 3D solid image. Fast forward to the 1990s, a wave of interest in virtual reality as an artistic and entertainment medium. Man is a credulous animal, and we have always wanted to occupy and explore new worlds and alternative realities. VR is a spiritual yearning for man. Ultimately, it speaks to our desire to be elsewhere. Virtual world entertainment, which I got involved with in 1992 with Tim Disney, took a simulator-based approach or cab-based VR. If you can get people to suspend their disbelief, you don't need photographic reality. If it's a good game, if you get people believing in the fiction and actively participating in it, man, that's disbelief. That works. This place is something else, Dave, and get ready because the world as we know it is about to change forever. Not only is it, is it a completely new thing, but it's a beautiful thing. It, it's different every time. It's, it's more akin to playing basketball or soccer than it is a video game because people are playing uh, and people are unpredictable. So we conceived of essentially what we call Disneyland in a box. A central story, a central mythology, unlike Disneyland, which has, you know, a hundred acres, that these took no physical space, that there were an unlimited number of destinations that you could go. So we could create the experience of Disneyland for groups of people in, in 5,000 square feet. Well, at the time, uh, you know, we imagined that we would be introducing a new world every few months. It turned out that the cost of doing that and the technological obstacles to doing that on the schedule we needed to do it were insurmountable for us. It was a, it was a crazy adventure. It was the, uh, the early days of uh, what people were beginning to call virtual reality. In 1994, 1995, a phenomenon developed called the internet. And it basically for 10 years monopolized the attention of everybody in the technology business. And virtual reality retreated to the realm of the lab and the academic. There were people like Skip Rizzo at USC who were hacking together different kinds of VR solutions for different problems. Rizzo was specifically addressing PTSD and Palmer Luckey was an intern in his lab and subsequently hacked two iPhones together to create the prototype for the Oculus Rift. The Oculus was acquired by Facebook and that reignited commercial interest in virtual reality. You find artists of all different kinds attracted to these media and materials. Whether a maker comes out of game design or an MFA program, you can still have a result that's going to reinvent the genre and capture people's attention. Marshall McLuhan said that Artists are nature's early warning signals. They see things and feel things before most of us. And these new tools allow them to express themselves in exciting new ways and surprising new ways. 
And artists love surprise. And artists love immersion. As soon as you get in the headset, you're in a world that is populated by nothing but the work that you've created. I want to be in an empty space and I want to fill it with my own ideas. I want to be in a world that is complete and that's mine. Oh, here's some of the actual, like, Dear Angelica stuff before Dear Angelica was in Quill. Um, we made a lot of sample assets in this way, and then these shapes would get kind of projected onto geometry. My name is Wesley Allsbrook. I am an artist, an art director, and a writer. And I got this email from Sashka Unseld, the then creative director of Oculus Story Studio. And he asked if I wanted to help them do concept art for a piece called Dear Angelica. It was the first animated piece made in VR for VR. There is not a 2D cut that exists. And this was a way that VR had not really been made before. People weren't creating in the headset for the headset. And that became the sort of sound bite for Dear Angelica. Day to day uh, of my kind of life, I would say that most people think that you're working out of these big technical studios or something with people with VR headsets and crazy labs and things like that. But I'm working here at my home studio 99% of the time. Starting off my career, it's always been just tools, right? Like you start with a pencil, and then I learned how to use a pen, pastels and paints, tablets and architectural mice. These are all evolutions of tools, and so we're now at this point where VR has kind of stepped in as a new tool, and to me, it's kind of just the next stage of the evolution process with technology, and they're all just tools. <laughs> The Spatial Reality Show at Eisenberg was an opportunity to meet some people that I had never met before, who I only knew by their work. A painting kind of exists on its own, whether you're there or not, but a work in XR, 3D, the final work is really in the viewer's mind. This exhibition in particular is really special. It's the first of its kind, and it's an interesting and exciting thing to see XR raised to a gallery space. It's a step in the direction of a new relationship between creators and the people who consume their work. This exhibit is bringing together a lot of different artists in one place, which, you know, you're gonna see different people using this tool set in different ways. I had little kids with their parents checking out stuff in virtual reality and to me seeing their excitement and being able to play with a new tech at such a young age is unfathomable to me because I grew up without the internet initially and so it's like the idea of, of people being able to access this stuff, it's just there's a lot of excitement around it which I think you don't always get at a museum or an art gallery or something, you know, there's not always that level of whoa or like what is going on here, <laughs> which I think that's just yeah, this is why it's kind of a special show, so, yeah. The future to me seems really wide open in terms of different genres and approaches. You know, the human potential of art making is so fulfilling. The ability to plumb the depths of the human imagination and then the capacity to experience these alter realities or alternative realities. When I write about virtual and augmented reality, I'm really writing about the future of mankind. 
not about a specific technology, not about a specific company, but where we as people will be. The importance of arts in our culture and in technology in particular, I think is underappreciated. When we've taken arts out of the schools and the public sector has become hostile to the arts, but rather than a supporter of it, that it's really critical that we have artists involved because they will save us. Yeah, that, that's what I have to say. <laughs>